All right, everyone, I want to welcome you back to track one of day two of the Python web conference. Our next speaker up is Rob McBroom from Six Feet Up, and he's going to be talking about Django and cookie cutter and getting started. So I'll let Rob take it away. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, so if you've never heard of cookie cutter, it is just uh, a tool for creating templates for projects where a project really is just a folder. So anything you can put in a folder, you can create a cookie cutter template to create that thing. Um, and it is written in Python, uh, but that really doesn't matter if you're actually, if you're just using it, um, it doesn't evolve any, any programming. Uh, and the product that comes out of it doesn't have to be Python either. I mean, one of the places I've used it in the real world is for creating Quicksilver plugins, which uh, that generates a, an Xcode project and it's all Objective-C uh, or Swift if you prefer and nothing to do with Python. So uh, anything that's a folder that you wanna be able to create quickly uh, in a repeatable way is what Cookie Cutter is for. Um, <clears throat> To install it is pretty easy. If if you're on a Mac, you can use Homebrew, uh, just brew install cookie cutter, uh, or it is written in Python, like I said. So if you can just create a virtual environment and pip install cookie cutter. Um, and I think there are some other options, but it's all very well documented here on their, on their site. So I'm not gonna go into detail. I of course already have it installed. Um, what we're going to be talking about today specifically is cookie cutter Django, which I will probably call Django cookie cutter more than once because I can never remember. But uh, this is just uh, a cookie cutter template that some very smart people have put together for creating Django projects um, with a lot of nice features and potentially complicated add-ons. Uh, that would normally require a lot of configuration. Um, they also implement a lot of best practices uh, that you don't have to learn. And, and I mean, you should learn them, but it's all kind of done for you if you're just getting started. Uh, just for some, some context, this is just a plain Jane Django project. If you follow the tutorial, which I would also recommend on the official Django website. Um, yeah, getting fooled by my, here we go. So if I go look at this, this is what you get by default with Django. You just get a page, the nice rocket and some links to some other places. Uh, there's, you know, really nothing here you can use except maybe the, you know, the admin interface is there, but there are no users either. You would have to go create that. Um, so just for contrast, when I show the cookie cutter variety, um, so I'm going to go ahead and run it. When you're running cookie cutter, uh, the only argument that's required here is the template. Uh, which is itself a folder. Uh, you can use a local folder. You can go, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of cookie cutter templates out there. You can just go download one to your computer and then pass in that folder as the argument here. But one thing that's nice about it is uh, you can also just give it a URL. Uh, and since 99% of those URLs are probably out on GitHub, there's actually a shortcut where you can just uh, pass in gh colon and then the owner of the repo and the name of the repo to uh, start your, your uh, project. Now, I cheated a little bit because uh, just to make this go faster, I, what I did was I took the cookie cutter Django and just change the default values for when you run it, just so I don't have to type as much. Um, Cause we all know how live typing goes. So I'm gonna run from that. So what it will do is ask 
uh, a series of questions. Uh, these are configured in the template. Uh, no, I'm not talking to you, Siri. Um, and the value there in brackets is the default. So I could type whatever I want here, uh, but I purposely set this up so I could just take the defaults. Um, so the project slug here is this will be the name of the folder that everything ends up in and uh, maybe use elsewhere in the, in the project, depending on the template uh, description. A lot of these are pretty self-explanatory domain and email version. Uh, what you're manipulating here doesn't have to be source code. This, uh, this will just drop a license file in your project, which uh, of course is just text, uh, depending on what you choose here. Um, we're not using Windows or PyCharm. I'm going to say no to this initially. We'll come back and, and do it again later with Docker. Um, and then I was just asking about various, uh, you know, database backends. How am I going to host it? Outbound mail. Um, and so Django DRF, that's the Django REST framework. I'm going to enable that because we're going to, we're going to show that a little bit. Um, and then these are just various helpful add-ons to Django or other external services you may want to use. Uh, we're also going to, we're going to see Mailhog. Uh, so I'm just going to tap through the rest of these real quick. So what that gave me was this project, this IndiePy demo here, um, which if you have seen a Django project before, this will look somewhat familiar, uh, but they've already done some of the work for you know, splitting out the settings by environment rather than just a single settings.py. Um, they've also, there's support for uh, Django Environ, which uh, if, if you're not familiar with that, you can, anywhere you see in the settings, a reference to this ENV, that means it's, it's looking for a .env file in the project, which I don't have here, but it will also look in your, at your environment variables. Uh, so this is a really cool add-on that you're going to want to use for most of your projects. They have already done it for you, which is really nice. And there are a lot of, a lot of things like that, that you get for free. Um, and then based on the project slug I provided, it also created a single application inside the project with the same name. And this is where you will find, you know, your, your models, views, URLs, etc. Um, so we're not going to dig into the details of a Django project, but uh, that is what we ended up with. So to actually use this, um, I'm going to need to install the you know Django and all the other Python packages. Uh, so let me go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm going to create a virtual environment in this folder. Activate it, and then uh, first thing I'm going to do is just update pip because I don't want to see the warning. And then I can install the requirements. That's another thing that uh, the cookie cutter project did was it generated this local.txt with all the requirements in it that I'm going to need. While that's going, I'll go ahead and create the database that I'm going to need. And I'm going to need an environment variable. Like I said, Django Environ will, um, will look at your config files, but it can also read from environment variables. So just to make this quicker, I'm going to define the database that way. Yeah, it's still going. I will uh, go ahead and show the database here. You'll see this is empty as you would expect because we just created it. 
a minute ago. So the first thing you want to do with any Django project is migrate, which can be used to make changes to the database, but of course, for a brand new project, we'll just set it up to be used in the first place. So I'll run that and it will go through all the steps. And now if I come over here and look, you see we have a, a basic Django database, which with not a whole lot in it, um, you know, no users or anything yet because we just created it. Uh, but now that that's done, we can go ahead and run our, our server. We should be able to connect and there it is. Now, in contrast to the generic Django project, you see this one actually has sort of a little nav bar, um, sign in, but again, no users yet, but built in for free with the cookie creator project, we can go ahead and sign up. Um, so, you know, self sign up. So we'll do uh, thank you here. Now, another thing that cookie cutter has done for us is it won't let you log in until you confirm your email address. So that email, since I told it, we want to use MailHog, that just went to, uh, it's basically in memory on my local system. I don't know if you're familiar with MailHog. It's really cool. Um, it just listens on an SMTP port and an HTTP port. So you can send it messages. doesn't matter if the address is real or not. This address is obviously not real, but it'll receive the mail. And then you can go in through HTTP to the nice UI to view the mail. Um, and then this is just, you know, your standard confirm your email type of message. So I'll click that to confirm. And now that account should actually work. And now I'm signed in. Uh, so that is pretty cool and would normally require a lot of work to get set up. Um, It was all done basically for us. Um, I'm going to do another thing here. I'm going to add a super user. Oh, I did not set the. Oh, because I'm not in a virtual environment. There we go. So now I've got a super user, but you'll notice even though that user exists, and I know the password, I still can't even use that account until I've verified it. So we'll go back to mail hall. We should see another message. I'll activate that one. Don't need those anymore. Now we'll confirm that. Now if I log in, so now I can log in as my super user and I can access the admin interface and all of that. Um, another thing that the cookie cutter template gave us was this profile feature where you can come in and edit your information. Um, but I want to demonstrate another feature because we just simply said yes to Django REST framework. That means we have an API for interacting with our data just right out of the box. So I can, uh, with my super user credentials, I can go in and request details about a user. Um, but I can also, of course, with a put request and the username argument, which is required, I can uh, update values on the data. And then it'll, after it does the update, it'll return back to me with the new information. And if I come in here and refresh this, so now I've got my name defined here via the API. So yet another thing that would have taken a long time to implement probably had you done it all by hand from scratch. Um, super easy with, with a uh, cookie cutter. So um, that is just using the, the standard, you know, more traditional way, I guess you would call it. Uh, let me get out of here.
But now I'm going to destroy all of that. Start over. I need to shut down Mailhog on my local machine because Docker is going to take over that port. Um, so we're going to do this again, but this time we're going to tell it yes to Docker. So start with that. Just going to accept all the defaults here. Okay, so now if we look at our project. It's more or less the same, but we have some extra stuff here that wasn't there before. We have this compose folder uh, for Docker Compose, and then we have the local.yaml and production.yaml files. Um, these, as you might imagine, are instructions for Docker. So again, I need to set an environment variable. This time it's the compose file. I don't have to do this, but it'll save me some typing. So when I run Docker Compose, I'm going to do that here too. When I run Docker Compose, I don't have to pass in the dash F every single time with the path to the file. Um, so Docker Compose build, and that will run through a bunch of stuff. Um, that's going to take a minute. While that's going, I wanted to show uh, a little bit of the original source for this. This is the actual cookie cutter Django template itself. Uh, so two things that will always be present in any cookie cutter template are the cookie cutter JSON file, which is the configuration. So you can see here, these should look familiar. Uh, the keys, this is just a big dictionary, the keys are um, the names of the variables you want to use in your template. And then the values here are the defaults, which as you saw, you can override. Uh, but what's cool is this itself is processed by the templating language, which is uh, Jinja 2, if you're curious. Um, so you can, whatever value was provided here by the user, you can immediately use that and do transformations on it, et cetera. So that's how you end up with the, you know, lowercase underscore, you know, safe to use in a URL type slug um, in the project. Uh, something similar for the email address based on my name. It just took my first name and adds, um, in this case, example.com, because uh, this is the original, not the one that I modified. Uh, for the things that are multiple choice, I'll, you, the value is just a list, and the default will be whatever you put first in that list. Um, so that part is pretty easy. Uh, the, the, other, the other thing you will definitely see is this folder here. Um, this is what actually gets used to create your project. So when the project's generated, what I was showing earlier looks very much like this. Um, none of these things will be included when you actually generate your project. Um, only the things in here. And you notice this folder looks sort of like a templating language thing. That's because it is. You can, uh, you can use variables uh, that you requested from the user in the names of folders as well. Um, for some of those yes, no, uh, where do I want to go here? For some of those yes, no questions, like uh, do you want to use celery, for instance, you'll see in here that this is just a template. So if you if you said you want celery, it will add celery to the requirements. Otherwise, it won't because it's just a waste of time and space and adding complexity that you don't need. Um, so there are a lot of things like that everywhere. Uh, same for the configuration files um, in the settings. This looks like Python, but really it's just a template at this point uh, until it gets added to your project. So you can use the templating things even in here. Um, so conditional things, like if you said use Docker, that will affect the database's 
default value, things like that. So um, there's a lot of fairly complicated stuff you can do with your cookie cutter template uh, to make the project come out the way you want. So that is done. So we are going to run it again, this time under Docker. So if you watch the dashboard over here, you should be able to see things happening. But notice here, it's running the migrations for me when I bring it up, which is nice. But the only reason that works is because the database is already running, the database has already been created, and the uh, all of the dependencies are already created. When I ran Docker Compose build, you'll see up here, it has already gone out and downloaded and installed all the requirements that were defined. Um, it's already running Mailhog, all of that. So <clears throat> now I should be able to connect once again. So this is now running in the container, not directly on my local machine, but we get all the same features um, that we had before. So I can, uh, well, one thing I should show, it's a little more complicated if you want to run your management commands uh, because the the um, you know everything's running inside a container now so in order to do that you just need to to prefix it with docker compose run um, then everything from this point forward is is the same as before so we'll go ahead and create our super user So now I should be able to sign in with that account, confirm my email. Going to Mailhog again. Now this is this is the Mailhog referenced down here. This uh, extra container. That's why I had to shut it down on my local machine. I mean, I could have put it on a different port, but it's easier to just use their defaults. So confirm that email again. I can log in. And I've got my account. I will uh, go in and manipulate the data for that account and reload. And I should see, there we go. Um, just like it was before, but now it's all on Docker. And that that saved me. I mean, if if you're already using Docker, you've got everything set up, that saved a, a lot of work because um, you don't have to, it just saves a lot of extra work on the initial setup. Um, keeps everything nice and isolated from the rest of your system as well. Uh, if you sign out, you can see all of this still works. Verify. And Stan should be able to log in. Here we can go. Oh, what's that about? Oh. Okay, well. Clearly, I'm not as familiar with that API as I should be, but <laughs> we've got a 
fully functioning app in, I don't know what it, most of the time was spent downloading things. <laughs> um, so that's pretty cool. And I blew through that way too quick. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. I don't know. Are there? There are? Okay. Yeah, there, there's a, a question about if there's a similar Flask cookie cutter that you could recommend. I haven't looked into it, but um, that wouldn't surprise me because, you know, Flask is so simple and so flexible that um, there are probably a lot of things you could do um, to save time. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about uh, the Django cookie cutter is that, to me anyway, it occupies sort of a weird place uh, as far as who its audience is, because if you're brand new, um, going through all those questions, you're probably not going to know what to say. For, you probably never even heard of half of that stuff. <laughs> like, what yeah. is DRF? What is white noise? You know. Um, so if you're a total beginner, um, it's it's maybe a little confusing. I, you, you're mostly okay just accepting their defaults for everything as you go through. Um, but uh, and then, but if you're then an expert who uses Django all the time, then you're probably opinionated and you know what you want, what you don't want, and you may not be happy with some of the choices they made. It is somewhat opinionated. Um, That's exactly the problem I ran into, is that you know, being that we are opinionated about how we do things, I took their cookie cutter and shifted it to be our cookie cutter. So we have a, there's one in the six feet out right. repository that's familiar, but not the same thing. Yeah. Um, but I will say, even if, um, even if you are a beginner, you don't know what the stuff is or you're sort of intermediate, it's still a, a great resource for, uh, seeing best practices in a Django project. Yep. Um, not, you know, both for how the project is laid out, uh, but also if you know you want to have some particular add-on that does something, but you're not sure which one is sort of reputable or reliable, um, you could look to see if, if the cookie cutter is using it, it's probably being well-maintained, it's probably trustworthy, that sort of thing. So. Uh, it's a good resource, even if you're not going to literally use it to create a project. Um, yeah, a I will tip. typically cre create a cookie cutter on my file system using all the options I'm kind of interested in looking at and keep it as a reference, as like you said, like best practices. Right. Um, it's also good, you know, if you're if you're teaching a class and maybe not the stock cookie cutter Django project, but if you find yourself doing something over and over again, um, or if you are teaching class and you want all of your students to create a project that's almost the same, but a little bit different in a couple of ways, then you, you know, you could just hand them a URL for a cookie cutter template. And mm -hmm. they could just, you know, Actually, there, the there's a really good question or comment in the uh, Slack track one that they're using build out to manage their Django projects. And you have some experience uh, with this, like I do with using build out to manage a Django project. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how we moved and why we moved away from build out for some of the Django projects for our people. Well, I don't know. I could make a comment about build out more generally, um, which I know Calvin has heard me say this before, but I mean, build out is cool. Uh, build out is generally good, but it, it really it is only going to work on the day you made it in a lot of cases. <laughs> if you wait a week and try to run build out again, uh, who knows? Because so many things change with PyPy. Like one of the biggest problems we had with build out is when PyPy switched everything to HTTPS, uh, which was the right thing to do. But if you've got old build outs from like six years ago with, you know, old dependencies and things like that, then you can, it's just not going to work and you're going to have to refactor things. Um, so the, you know, the dream of repeatable deployment uh, is not being met. Um, so I think, yeah, for a lot of our projects, we've been using pipenv for some. 
Uh, I know Calvin has kind of maybe soured a little on that, but. I'm coming back around. I, I, I saw the session yesterday oh. about bootstrapping. It was boot, the bootstrapping Django session yesterday in tutorials, and he was back on it again. And uh, he may convince me to come back around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, you know, we're seeing releases again. And uh, so I don't, I, I, I don't really have any problems with it. Uh, Mikael in the chat room says, I promise we have every egg pen and our build outs are repeatable. I can promise you <laughs> we've seen them break and we thought we had every egg pen. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe it is now as, you know, as long as there's nothing, nothing else equivalent to a switch to HTTPS <laughs> in the future, <laughs> you're probably True. okay. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I don't mind build out, but uh, I do feel like um, a lot of my job is troubleshooting build out rather than, you know, the Python parts of the, <laughs> of the project. Yeah. Um, just when we're getting started, but now, did you mention during, I, I didn't hear all the talk, but did you mention during the talk, uh, the 12 factor app and like how this plays into that? No. Um, so that is, let's see, is that linked from the, from it is here? linked from the docs, like maybe the front page of the doc, I think. Yeah. Every, and every, I mean, I went through quick because everything is very well documented, both for cookie cutter itself, um, and for the. Django cookie cutter project, like first and foremost, all of those questions that it asks you when you run it, this will tell you what they are. Um, I mean, sort of, if, if you don't know what, like I said, if you don't know what any of these things are, uh, you know what to say, but at least here you have links where you can go read more about it and say, oh yeah, okay. Uh, but see the 12 factor, I don't know where that link is. It's on the very front page of the for the docs with the Django cookie cutter. I don't know. Is that like a is there like a philosophy somewhere? Or? <laughs> not so, but maybe there's not any text on this page. Is it the word? I mean, you can just search if you just search up twelve factor app, <clears throat> you'll you'll get an idea for what that's about. But moving to a twelve factor app. It frees you up from a lot of things, and staying in build up is hard to do with a 12 factor app. Yeah, so this heavily inspired uh, the design of the the Django cookie cutter template. Anyway, mm -hmm. I mean, nothing to do with cookie cutter itself, but no. But if there's folks who are wanting to to do these things, the cookie cutter template's a good place to start for that. Yeah. Cool. Well, I don't see any other questions or chatter in the uh, Slack channels or on Slido. And so with that, I think we can, unless you got any more, more things you want to add, Rob? No, I was, I was sort of expecting questions about like Tmux or <laughs> <laughs> right. my prop, setup. things like that. You know, get yeah, for those of you who don't know, uh, Rob is very opinionated about his computer. So there's lots of things you want to talk to him about on um, opinions on computers. Uh, find him in the Slack room. He's also one of the co-maintainers of Quicksilver. So mm -hmm. if you like launchers like that, you'll want to talk to Rob. 